Welcome to everyone, and we'll call the meeting to order. And the first thing, question that I ask every week, of course, is uh, we'll review and approve the agenda. Would everyone please check their agenda and make sure that they're in agreement with it, or have, if they have suggestions, this would be the time and place. And if there are no changes and there's a motion, thank you. Move to approve the agenda. Second. Thank you, Jean. All those in favor? And it's unanimous of those present. So we'll continue with the agenda. Second would be to approve the minutes. And everyone has received the minutes and a little opportunity to look over those. Motion from Jean Goodman to move to uh, accept the minutes and a second for that. Um, we need people who are here. Thank Can you. I second my own yes, motion? thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, I think that at this point, all those in favor would, you were not here, right, so abstain, okay? <clears throat> so uh, all those in favor of the minutes as they are now, and I'm not sure if we can do that without a quorum. quorum. Yes, and those of those here, I think the decision we made of those here, if, if they were all in favor in the past, that that would mean that they'd pass. Yes. Moving on to the comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes are allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each subject. Is there anyone who would like to speak at this point? I see no hands go up or anyone interested in stepping toward the mic. We'll move then on to reports and recognition. Uh, and I would turn to Ms. Dr. Carenti, if you would introduce, please. Sure. Good evening. Uh, it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce Mary Hanna, our K through eight social studies coordinator, and Mr. Bob Stevenson, our social studies high school chair department leader. Um, both Mary and Bob will be presenting from the table this evening, if that's acceptable from all of you, um, because they will be interchanging as they're speaking about slides, and it may be slightly distracting for them to get up and down. Um, I did want to mention this evening that approximately a month ago, you may recall me talking about the new state framework in social studies um, that has been adopted. So this evening gives us a great opportunity to talk about how we take a national framework, a state framework, and bring it into the Nicanian Public Schools curriculum. So we're very pleased to give you a brief overview of the social studies curriculum. We also want to make sure that we give you an update on what we've been doing with our curriculum writing, um, because you do support that during our summer months, as well as other times throughout the school year. And then we also want to bring in what it looks like in the classroom. And I think you'll have a nice opportunity to see a strand and how it follows through from second grade into the middle school, right into the high school. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Mary and Bob, who have been spending a lot of time on staying well-educated, um, not only in research, but also participating in the writing of the new framework um, for the state of Connecticut. And I know Mary's been actively involved, and, and we'll be sharing some of that as well. So. Can you hear me? Is this on? Yeah. Is this on? So this has been a very exciting time for social studies in Connecticut and the country. And tonight, as uh, Dr. Carenti mentioned, we're going to just share with you a few of the different frameworks that are out there, um, what that looks like in New Canaan, and give you some snapshots of what's happening in our social studies classrooms. And the first framework that we want to share um, is called the C3. It's a national framework which came out on actually on Constitution Day, September 17th, 2013. And it really takes the place of the former National Council of the Social Studies Standards documents. And it's called the C3, um, which stands for Career, College, and Civics. Um, and to quote, I'm just going to quote um, what the Council of Social Studies says about the framework. And the C3 framework emphasizes the acquisition and application of knowledge to prepare our students for college, career, and civic life. It intentionally envisions social studies instruction as an inquiry arc, 
of interlocking and mutually reinforcing elements that speak to the intersection of ideas and learners. So the four dimensions of the C3 framework center on the use of questions to spark curiosity, guide instruction, deepen investigations, <coughs> acquire rigorous content, and apply knowledge and ideas in real world settings to become active and engaged citizens in the 21st century sounds very similar to our mission statements and things that we've been working on right along in New Canaan. In addition, you're gonna find the last bullet point as we talk briefly about our own K-12 Enduring Understandings and Skill Sequence. You'll see right there that the date's 2010. We were really working a little bit before the C3 framework on the exact same thing. So we were ahead of the curve and it's really very reassuring to see with some of the work with the C3 and how much aligned we were and the direction was very positive. Um, I've been fortunate to work um, a little bit with the C3 as now it becomes actualized with some groups across the country and we've been using Google Chat or Google Hangout and taking a look at what, for example, I've been working with a, a teacher from North Carolina and one from Ohio, and we've been looking at an immigration unit. And what would that look like in our own states, in our own local district, and creating some um, pieces together? So the C3 framework is not really a curriculum at all. It's a framework that guides states in the creation of their own frameworks. But it also gives us a point of dialogue and intersection so we can talk about the same thing, not just in our district, but with other educators across the country. So it's been very valuable for that piece of work. The uh, next piece that's, I think, particularly exciting for New Canaan and in particular the state is the Connecticut State Framework, which was just adopted two months ago by the State Board of Education. And again, it's a framework. It's not a curriculum. It's guiding. Um, different districts like ours in as we revise or review or we search to tweak any of the units that we have, we can look to that framework for guidance. Um, it doesn't prescribe or mandate, um, but provides a really nice framework um, using some of the C3 pieces um, to match what our kids could uh, do in New Canaan and the state. Um, as Dr. Carenti mentioned, I was very fortunate to be able to help write parts of the state framework um, and worked at the elementary level and the middle school level with other educators from across the state as we looked at what we wanted our framework to be. So that's been very exciting, exciting work. Um, <laughs> sure, uh, on, on those frameworks at the, uh at, at the high school, their recommendations are, are very much in line with what we're already doing. The two uh, caveats would, would be that, um, as we've heard in, uh, in, in other states, um, the AP US history has extended their timeline while the state of Connecticut and the C3 have kind of crunched it down and said, we'd like to start after the Civil War, uh, but our AP courses still needs to deal with the whole breadth of US history. Um, but but it, our, our regular US classes do begin in line with the framework at, at the same time. The other piece is their recommendation is for one uh, year of, of global history uh, that would be a modern global history, but if you would like to cover other material, their recommendation is that you cover that over two years, which is exactly what we do at, at the high school. Um, so I, I think we're, we're in great shape to uh, answer to the, 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 the requests of that framework in Connecticut. Um, along those lines, at the high school, we, we've also uh, taken to looking quite closely at the AP College Board historical thinking skills. They're a fairly concise framework or, or a set of skills, just four skills um, in historical argumentation, chronological reasoning, comparison and contextualization, historical interpretation and synthesis. And there's a lot of overlap between, we'll find, with, with all four of these uh, frameworks and skill sets. Uh, and, and, and so the, the, the documents very much work together. Uh, did you want to speak about the? Uh, the, uh, the K-12 stuff? 
a little bit later. Oh, okay. And and on on the K twelve piece, um, Mary was more intensely involved with that stuff. It was uh, Richard Webb was the former department chair who worked closely on that. I was in and in and out of it. So just to give you a brief history, I think there's, last time that we came to speak about social studies was probably about four years ago as we were unrolling our exciting new topical, it was then topical sequence. Um, so just to give you a brief snapshot of the history to bring you up to date, um, you'll see that under our research and development that K-12, uh, we, in 2008, I believe it was, we took, a, there was a group of teachers and administrators that were charged with evaluating and revising where necessary our K-12 curriculum. Uh, this group spanned elementary through high school and we conducted a lot of research uh, both locally, across the country, internationally. And the same group worked on the K-12 district document, which you'll see is the K-12 district enduring understandings document from 2010. That's the one that we referred to uh, briefly before. <coughs> and really what that does is gives us a look at what we want our students to understand as they leave New Canaan. Uh, a companion document was also created by the same K-12 group, which is called the K-12 Social Studies Skills Sequence, and it outlines also what we would like our students to be able to do in the social studies as they leave New Canaan Public Schools. Um, and we find that they are still um, very much used, very much up to date. There may be a little bit of tweaking as we look at our new Connecticut framework just to make sure that we've, you know, earmarked inquiry in the right place and there'll be a little bit more um, revision, but we're right on the, the right path with those. So that, as a result of that work that started in 2008, then another group was charged with looking really particularly at that K-4 sequence uh, to make sure that we eliminated some redundancy and make sure that we had a little bit more of a rigorous curriculum. So you'll see that K-4 work over to the left. We drafted a new K-4 <coughs> topical sequence and started some work with uh, some integration. Um, one of the unique features of our K-4 topical sequence is that not only do we provide our students with a cohesive and coherent and aligned curriculum in understanding their own uh, community and country, we also have a world component where their uh, students at each grade level do study and learn a little bit about another continent so that even um, our younger students are having a chance to learn locally and then also learn on a global kind of basis. Um, and obviously this work is ongoing. We're in the fourth year of implementation. And right now our, the first cohort that's had only our new topical sequence is right now in third grade. So you will see on this slide that we don't have fifth through eighth grade mentioned here. Um, we're going to show you the current work that's happening there to be responsive to that first cohort coming through elementary and moving into the middle school. And uh, during that same time period over the past five years at the high school, we've worked through uh, each year through one of the core curriculum and revising those curriculum units. So I think five years ago now we looked at Global 1 and 2. Uh, over a two-year period, four and three years ago we looked at the United States history curriculum. That one took longer because the U.S. history curriculum is, a, is really three courses. Uh, students can choose to either look at U.S. history, American studies, or AP U.S. history. So we got that whole group together uh, during a few of the school days, some after school time, um, over, over the course of two years and, and really brought our heads and our thinking together about both themes, chronology, all of that, uh, and, and working with these new, these new K-12 um, frameworks. Uh, one, uh, and then the civics curriculum, and, and this kind of, I think it points out a change in the, the way curriculum is being developed by our department. Um, the, the global curriculum was very much done over the summer and summer work, traditional cur summer curriculum writing. The U.S. history work done during the school day for the most part or after school. And then the civics work has actually happened mostly over the past year or so. Well, well, it happened three years ago during department meetings. And then over the past year, they've actually revised and rewritten uh, a bit of it uh, during PLC work or professional learning committee work. 
uh, where all the civics teachers have a common planning time at the high school. That's new in the last couple of years. And, and that has allowed them to do this during the school year, some of this work. So the, the, the civics curriculum is, all the curricula at this point are very much more living documents, organic documents that are growing and, and adjusting as we move. Just to give you a snapshot of how our curriculum is designed in social studies, um, we're understanding by design and concept based in our curriculum, which um, I'm sure is, is not new to you. Um, if you look at this quote, I'm going to switch to the next slide, if you don't mind. And if you go down, this is a unit planner that we thought we would show you, and this is for a new um, geography unit that was taught in seventh grade this year. And this is where the design process really starts. And you'll see in the upper middle box, those are our enduring understandings, those big generalizations that we want to aim um, students toward. And you'll see the set of matching or corresponding essential questions, which sort of open up that line of inquiry as students are investigating and um, making sense of the unit. Below that, you'll see our concepts that we use as sort of that glue. And then the surrounding adjacent boxes are really that topical understanding where we look at um, something within a topic and we have some guiding questions, um, some assured formative assessments, and then we also take a look together at what might be a pre-assessment set of questions or um, assessment and look at a performance-based assessment or an assessment that would um, enable us to see what measure understanding at the end of the unit. So just to give you a little bit of a snapshot of where teachers go when they do this, this backwards design in this UBD, this tends to be the first thing that comes out of those groups. And then they take this and then we'll drill down to, well, what do we want specifically to have our kids know and do in this unit? What will those formative assessments actually look like? What's that evidence of understanding we really want? What misconceptions are there in the unit? Are there assured resources we want all the students to um, access, or do they vary? Um, so those are some of the kinds of decisions we make, but that's the unit planner. So just to bring you up to date and what's currently happening, We've both put in last year and this year as sort of part of our current work, um, starting first with the K-8 department, um, with our K-4 units all aligned, and our first cohort moving up through elementary school. The time now is to look at middle school to make sure that we're fully aligned and not only with our Connecticut state documents, but with our own sequence. We also look at the College Board thinking skills. We look ahead, we look behind. You know, that vertical alignment is, is very important. Um, current attention, there was a little bit of a change in fifth grade to um, revise units slightly last year. As you know, FLESS um, is integrated into the social studies classroom, so we felt that we needed to do some rev revision to reflect that change of instructional time. Our current attention is really with sixth and seventh grade. Um, these grades put together form a one-year course on world regions and geography. Um, historically, our split has been ancient civilizations in year one in sixth grade, and then more modern world in grade seven. So the new emphasis and the new thinking, um, and this goes across the country, because that was a very common split for most districts across the country, is to do a little bit more of a blend, ensuring that our students explore different regions in the world with an eye to the continuity and change of regions so that they understand that history is not static, that it's not locked in time, but some of those understandings can actually inform us today. Um, with this in mind and the new Connecticut State Framework, we've been examining our units to ensure we're providing a balance and that it comes right back to the so what. I'm learning this, what does this mean for me as a citizen? So for an example, in sixth grade, we moved the study of Greece and Rome um, to right after the Fertile Crescent unit. Instead of putting, if some of you remember from your, your own young children, <laughs> um, instead of doing India and China, 
we moved the we created a <coughs> unit called the Legacy of Greece and Rome. Moved that right after Fertile Crescent, so the students could really see what was happening in that whole region, which is really multiple regions and how they interfaced, and. Um, could make those connections of some of that legacy right back to our own U.S. government. So why are we studying Greece and Rome? What is that legacy and how does that impact us today? So students are bringing it right back home and, and getting to some of that so what. And that's been very powerful. In grade seven, we focus on various regions in Asia. And this year, we took a lens of the power of geography, not just being a place on the map, but understanding that that encompasses natural resources, movement of people, borders. Well, who decided this is the border? Is this a natural border? Is this a created border? Um, and students learned about the natural resources such as the oil in Southwest Asia and were readily able to connect to that black gold to economics. And with our own rise and fall of oil prices right now, we found the student engagement really just soaring and making those connections on an everyday basis and those conversations taking place at, at home as well, which is always exciting. Um, Part of another part of an important part of our work, especially 5 8, has been to create some common rubrics that we could use across grades. So, if we're looking at argument, which is sort of the response to inquiry really in social studies, how are our kids able to make a claim? How are they backing that with sound evidence and reasoning? And we've been looking at student work and looking across the grades to really um, align our own thinking and to encourage student growth in that area. And that's been very exciting to really talk about student argument 5-8 and where our kids are. So we're going to continue with some of that work. Thanks. Uh, at the high school, we've added several AP courses over the past two years. Um, last year, we added a advanced placement comparative government. We added uh, both a advanced placement microeconomics and macroeconomics. Those courses were written, submitted to the College Board, and approved last year. This is their second year being, being taught. Uh, last year, we also began the regularly scheduled PLC work, professional learning community work, in Global I, Global II, U U.S. History, American Studies, and Civics. Uh, to give you an example of the kind of work going on in those, those committees uh, or communities, uh, today, walking in the office, there was a group of five teachers, uh, the librarian and a tech uh, integrator. Uh, they were working on a revision to a project looking at the collapse of societies. They look at both uh, Roman, the collapse of Roman Greece as a, as a case study, but then they're, they're, they're more interested in looking at other examples throughout time uh, and, and throughout the world. Um, and that project's been around for four or five years now. It's one of the, it covers a, a bunch of the essential questions in the third unit of Global History One, and they're trying to, to, to make sure it still reflects the other kinds of collapses we see uh, of societies in, say, the wake of uh, the Arab Spring. When, when that was happening, uh, we were literally working on this project as it was taking place and uh, watching live feeds out of there. Well, that's several years back now, so we, we're continuing to revisit uh, those kinds of assignments. Uh, this year, uh, the AP U.S. History curriculum has had to be revised. The teachers had to resubmit a new uh, uh, syllabus to College Board. And AP European History, uh, that needs to be submitted next January. Uh, these are to reflect the, the, the changes that have been in the news recently about uh, AP U.S. History. Um, those changes, asking teachers to look back to pre-Columbian, as far back as pre-Columbian things, and, and changing the nature of some of the essays and writing prompts that they, they uh, look at. Um, AP Psychology, Advanced Placement Psychology, was added this year. So this is the first year that's running, and that syllabus has been submitted and accepted by College Board. Um, during the year, as I mentioned earlier, the, the civics professional learning community has taken on a, a mini rewrite of, of their curriculum to make sure that that's up to date. And uh, interestingly, well, interest, it's been interesting work for, for Mary and I, I think, uh, for me. We've, we've taken a look at the transition between eighth and ninth grade. Um, there is a, a great deal of interest in our AP program for ninth graders. Uh, social studies is the only discipline that offers AP in, in ninth grade, and there's uh, 
I think interest and nervousness about that, and so we want to do our best to make sure everybody understands both children and, and parents, students and parents, what they're getting into. So we've been meeting, uh, we met on November 4th with uh, the eighth grade team at the middle school and the ninth grade team at the high school, and we talked about what are the kinds of skills that we're seeing transfer, and, and we're trying to figure out if there are any gaps and, and uh, how we can support students in this transition better. And out of that meeting came a, a, an interest in writing a, a performance task so that students could, or rewriting a performance task so that students uh, could get a look at where they, where they are, where they stand, where they're headed, what's going to be expected at the high school, and, and really get some uh, more precise information about readiness for, for those courses, uh, or at, at the high school, both the, the regular section course and the AP course. Um, we, we piloted that performance task last month, and the, the, that information will be going back to, to families in the next couple of weeks, and, and then I'm happy to have the conversations about it a, after that. Um, lastly, we, we've continued to work regularly in these professional learning communities on uh, our benchmark assessments, uh, whether it's a writing assessment or performance, uh, performance task. Um, we, we've tried to build several assured experiences into each one of the the high school core courses anyway. And that work's been taking place in department meetings, uh, in prof on professional learning days, professional learning time, and in the, the PLCs that I mentioned. Uh, we, we'd now like to sort of walk you through maybe a, a, um, a vertical alignment here to, to look at a, a set of skills as it plays out through uh, K through 12. So let's look at grade two. And we're just going to take a quick snapshot of using. Oops. I'm sorry. That's okay. Using evidence and reasoning to show understanding. That's okay. This just shows you a little bit of our unit and uh, the recent unit that our grade two students have engaged in is Waterways of the United States, and you can see in front of you their un key understandings and essential questions for the unit. And what I'll show you is a little bit, a little bit of a peek into, especially that under, under essential question that says, how do people use technology to meet their needs? Um, and you go to the next slide. This is just a piece of student work. It may be hard to see. The students really re responding to, um, they were asked to showcase a couple of ways that people have used technology to meet their needs on a river. And the kids began exploring uh, closer to home with the Connecticut River. And we have partnered with the Connecticut River Museum. They come to each second grade each year. They've been a, a wonderful resource, not just to our students, but our teachers, as they really understand um, innovation and technology and change over time. They really get to the, the change and continuity on the river. And what uh, our students do is they take on an, a role of somebody who might have lived or worked on the river. They might be a Native American or a settler or a farmer or an environmentalist or a recreational boater, someone who lived or worked on the river throughout time. And the kids before the Connecticut River Museum comes, they do a little research, they read a couple of articles about this, they understand their role, and then it's sort of showtime. When they come, they investigate, and you can see in the picture, the Connecticut River Museum has a long I don't know how long that is, probably 20, 25 foot long river that's on vinyl. And they've got all sorts of wonderful wooden structures and pieces that really um, represent the different structures and um, transportation um, and so forth on the river. So they label it and then they um, build what they would have built if they were a boat builder. They've got some pieces that they have to put together. And then we do what's called sort of a timeline, a living timeline, and we start way back with the, the Native Americans, and they introduce themselves and how they lived on the river and what happened. And then we've got Adrian Block and the, you know, the explorers from Holland coming and um, trading with the Native Americans. And we really see, in a very second grade appropriate way, the change in time um, 
on the river. But yet, at the same time, they're seeing some continuity about how the river was used. So we start there, and then the students go and explore the Mississippi River and are given some choices for other waterways that they might explore on their own in the United States to make those connections. So if what I'm learning in the Connecticut River about the change over time and who lived and worked here, and the challenges and opportunities they have. Did they have the same challenges and opportunities on the Mississippi River, another waterway? How did they meet those challenges? How did maybe technology help? So it's a little bit of that STEM piece, but thinking about it from a societal um, perspective. So in middle school, we're still thinking about similar pieces, um, supporting claims with logical reasoning, as relevant, accurate data and evidence that demonstrate an understanding of the topic or text using credible sources. So the same thing, using multiple sources to find um, answers to some of our questions. And I thought I'd just showcase for middle school a couple of pieces. Um, on the left, um, you can see a teacher modeling a little bit how to analyze some primary sources. One of the first things that fifth graders do when they come up to SACS is they're asked about Roanoke, and we've called it CSI Roanoke, and they've got to try to figure out what happened to those colonists. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of in the age-old mystery. Um, forensics and archaeology has been on our side because there are more, there are new clues. It's an actively um, it's not a dead file. They're still doing work. And every once in a while, we'll get an update. So it's very, um, it hooks them in and gives them a purpose for reading multiple sources and reading closely and making some of those, um, those thoughtful predictions. You'll see here um, in the middle some students working together on different sources, helping each other out. And then you'll see um, some of the questions, the essential questions that we use to frame the units. And if you read closely, um, hopefully you'll see that there are some overlaps. And as the kids, for example, when should a country expand shows up in sixth grade. And then there's also some expansion about geography causing expansion then in human geography. And then we take a look in eighth grade when we look at US history, it's a US history work. Um, how did the expansion of America beyond its borders and its evolving role within the world change domestic and foreign policies? So the same, you know, the sophistication, when you think about a second grader looking at waterways and borders and rivers going all the way to looking at the emergence of you know American foreign policy and the whole border issue it gradually picks up and sort of spirals through moving on to the high school and following that same strand of using evidence uh, I had several ways to pull uh, goals uh, or objectives here. In this case, this is a direct quote from the, the new uh, Connecticut framework that Mary worked on. And uh, just to read it, uh, we would like students to be able to identify evidence that draws information directly and subst substantively mm -hmm. from multiple sources to detect inconsistencies in evidence in order to revise or strengthen claims. This is really sophisticated thinking that we're asking. Um, and, and it, it, it draws directly upon the skills that, that Mary just outlined from second grade and, and the middle school. And then we, we get at this kind of thing in a number of ways. One of the, the most interesting is probably that we take this, this room over, uh, the Wagner Room here at the high school, uh, near the end of global history too, so it's kind of a culminating experience. And we hold a, a sophomore class-wide Model UN simulation. It's run by the Model UN Club. And students break up into several committees. They spread out um, uh, across the school for the day. They dress in suits and, and, and uh, business attire um, uh, to go along with the sophistication of the ideas they're, they're negotiating and, and uh, um, arguing. Um, they, they work in historical simulations that day. But all of it is based in evidence. All of it is based in, in their written position papers that they write and submit ahead of the simulation. Uh, they, they meet in groups and cite evidence to convince each other of their positions. Uh, they, they then can uh, create um, uh, new laws, proposals, uh, depending on the committee that they're in. Uh, and and it's, it, it asks students to, to do uh, uh, things on a number of levels that, that we expect of our students. 
uh, in addition to using the evidence, they're negotiating, they're problem solving, they're collaborating, they're um, uh, convincing each other. Uh, I, I also included on here a couple other examples um, that, that also require students to, to use evidence in their, in their work. Uh, in grade 10, near the middle of the year, they work on an imperialism project, and there are several forms of this, but I, I wanted to give you an idea of how they may do, the, they may use evidence, students may use evidence uh, in, a, in a digital format. So uh, students here will take sides on, a, on a, the, the benefits and the, um, the problems or the drawbacks of imperialism, and they, they take the point of view of, a, uh, of an imperialist nation and look at whether or not this experience is worth it in the context of the late 1800s. Um, and, and then they create these, these websites and try to convince each other uh, of the need to stay in, the, um, in, in that nation or leave. Um, in grade 10, uh, actually, we, we continue to ask students to use the evidence in, the, in, their, um, in their writing. In grade 11, they, there are two junior research papers. These are uh, graduation requirements at the high school, but one of them is done in, in social studies in U.S. history or AP history, U.S. history, or American studies. And the American studies fall version of that paper is an immigration research paper uh, where they're they're, they're going out and looking at a wide variety of databases and case studies, and largely these are student selected. So we'll do a few of these case studies in class, but then they're out there uh, really not being handed documents anymore, but seeking documents. And they're using those as the basis for a, a thesis-driven research paper. And. In the senior year and, and now in the junior year, uh, we have a, a large percentage of our students taking uh, advanced placement in social studies classes. Um, I, I included this separate slide because these, while it's, it's, it's interesting that we offer so many, I'm proud that we offer so many, uh, they really are an expression of some of the highest skills that we ask students to, to develop. And, and so we've, we've tried to offer as many angles as possible to students, and these are well-subscribed classes. So uh, currently there are eight. We offer advanced placement world history one and two. Students take the exam at the end of that course in their sophomore year. And that model UN simulation that I mentioned, all students are involved. So even the AP students, the, the uh, regular global history students, they're all in that simulation together. Uh, we offer a, AP US history to juniors. AP uh, European history to seniors, uh, U.S. government to seniors, um, and then we've the, the newer courses, comparative government, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and psychology will be opening up uh, next year to, to juniors as well as seniors. Um, we're seeing increasing enrollment in these classes. We're seeing strong performance from our students. Uh, we had 336 social studies AP exams taken last year. This year, our enrollment in those courses is 422 students. Uh, it's not separate students. Some of them are taking a, a couple of the AP courses. And a, a high percentage, over 90%, are scoring three or higher on those uh, tests or have for the, the past several years. So with an eye to the future, it's not, it's continuing the work. Um, we're continuing to review our K-8 units to make sure that they reflect the new state framework um, and look for any pieces that we need to maybe insert. Um, I, we don't expect any radical revision at all, just the ongoing looking at um, and making sure that we're aligning. Um, we're going to especially look at inquiry and historical literacies, which is always what we've been looking at, but we'll continue to refine that as we ask our kids to become independent investigators um, wherever they are in their history chronology. Um, we're also going to continue to look at common assessments and what they mean, and as our students are gaining um, skill and understanding and knowledge, uh, making sure that we're also reflecting that in our assessments and that we're looking for the rigor and looking at what we want for the student outcomes to be. Um, we're going to continue to expand and use shared rubrics across the middle school. We've been looking at argument, 
we're thinking of developing one for inquiry, um, just to really align our, our thinking as well. So we're going to continue on some of that work. At the high school, we, uh, we would like to begin, uh, over the next two years, we'd like to begin uh, reviewing the Global History 1 and 2 curriculum. That was the one that, that goes back five, six years uh, at this point in, in development. And while we've, uh, several of the projects and assessments that we designed for that have been rewritten already, but we, it's, it's time for a formal review of that curriculum probably. Um, we have, we will, uh, starting next year, open civics, well, actually, civics was open this year to juniors, but next year uh, we're already seeing increased interest in that. Um, students both taking civics in their junior year, it gives them more options senior year um, to explore other facets of the social studies, economics, and, and psychology, and AP Euro and things. Um, the, we're, this year, the United States History AP new curriculum has come online. Over the next two years, it'll be AP European next year, and then the following year, there'll be an AP World uh, rewrite. And, and those are all well, they're under development uh, by us. The, the adjustments are being made. Um, and, and in most cases, the, the syllabus is already submitted or ready to be submitted to the College Board for approval. Um, in general, uh, we would like, uh, we, we believe in the, the, those AP historical thinking skills are, are clear, concise, and, and high-level thinking for our students to be doing. We'd like to be preparing all uh, students for success in those courses. Whether or not they take them, that's our goal, to prepare them uh, for those. And uh, we, we're seeing interest from, I, we have currently half of our teachers trained and teaching, more than half of our teachers in the social studies department in the high school, trained in teaching AP courses. Uh, but we have interest from other teachers in, in gearing up either to, to, take the, uh, to teach the courses uh, or gearing up in their understanding of what those courses expect. Uh, this summer, I know of at least uh, three of us who will be taking um, or would like to take uh, advanced placement training courses um, around the country. And, and that's been the pattern for the past few years. So it, it's, it's great to see everybody in the department interested in pursuing understanding and, uh, of those skills because it's going to help us get all students to that level of performance. So, sure. So, as we mentioned before, um, some of our joint work K-12 will be to review our K-12 skills continuum. That was that 2010 ahead of the curve document um, in light of the new frameworks. And we're going to continue our vertical as well as horizontal alignment in social studies K-12 and continue some of those conversations, especially at those transition points of eighth grade into ninth grade and fourth grade into fifth grade. And continue. We both have um, sort of website digital warehouses for some of our curricular materials. So we're going to continue to do that. It's uh, something that we do for teachers to facilitate communication and, and the sharing of sort resources. We're going to continue that. And K-12, we've got work to look at our social studies benchmarks and assured experiences and align them and and look at student expectations. So we open this to any questions that you might have. Let me just start by saying what a comprehensive document this is and how interesting it is to watch the things that happen as you go through the different grade levels and uh, the depth that you go in it. But let me turn to the group and ask if there are questions because this is quite a lot to take. Tiana. First, I'd like to um, you know, congratulate you and it also reinforces what we constantly hear about this district is that we're ahead of the curve. We're not reacting to the curve. So, um, you know, it's nice to hear people in the trenches, you know, reaffirming that that's actually happening in this district. So thank you very much. It gives all of us, I think, a lot of confidence. So um, I had two questions. Um, first, at the K through eight level particularly, and at the high school as well, but it's probably more critical at the at the younger grades. How much coordination do you do with the English department? Because it sounds like you're you're really having to work with the kids on argument and mm -hmm. and writing skills, and so it would seem to be important. It is important. <laughs> we um, continue to have dialogues, as you probably understand. 
probably know that there has been some revision of some of the language arts sequence. So as that is being constructed, we're um, trying to increase the number of meetings that we have. For example, in seventh grade, um, we do pretty much in social studies do argument all year long. Um, and teachers have been sort of tag teaming and doubling up and, and talking about what well, what have my kids already done in argument? I want to pick it up from there. I'm not going to start and pretend that nothing has been done. What have you already done? So it's been wonderful to hear this year especially teachers really talking about a common practice. They're all of our kids and what are we doing so that we're not recreating that. So we hope that that dialogue keeps going because you're absolutely right. When we look at some of those benchmarks and assured experiences and some of those assessments, those are perfect places for us to say, hey, we're measuring the same thing. Can't we use the same, you know, same assessment, same task mm -hmm. to get at what both of us are looking at? So I think that those conversations will only multiply as we go down the pike. And okay. at, at the high school, um, there are several partnerships with the English department that have been useful. Uh, in 10th grade, we partner um, on a 10th grade benchmark assessment. There's an English version and a social studies version. That operates through the Writing Center. Um, the teams get together in, in, in meetings to, to rewrite the task each year. And then they, they uh, do a, a calibration session together for grade, scoring them. And then a group of 10th grade English, social studies, and, and Writing Center um, teachers all get together and, and score the 300 plus uh, essays uh, that, that students write. That happens twice a year, once in English and once in social studies. And then in the junior year, these are just a couple of the examples, but in the junior year on the junior research paper, and for many assignments actually throughout 9-12, uh, there's a, a, a coordination with the Writing Center uh, to, to help students through drafts, and um, in some cases we bring in Writing Center teachers to work with our students directly. Uh, and then the, the even, uh, the, the library has been a nice coordination between English and, and social studies with, with writing and research skills. I do also and want to emphasize the, uh, that we've worked very hard to find um, nonfiction material that relates right to our social studies units. Okay. So you may be walking into a language arts class in a K through four classroom and you'll be seeing them maybe teach text features about nonfiction, so they're still teaching reading. Mm -hmm. um, but it will be used, the social studies content. And then during social studies, they're teaching the content. It gives you just an example. And, and so, Bob, you did mention the American Studies program. I, I didn't. In fact, I co-teach I co <laughs> I, I co a, a, a class of uh, 45 students with an English teacher every day. We meet in, uh, to plan at least for an hour a day, more often two hours a day. The course meets for an hour and a half. About a third of our juniors take it each year, and it's an intense uh, collaboration between the English and social <laughs> studies. Um, Evan and I uh, spend a lot of time together. <laughs> Other questions? Scott. Uh, <clears throat> nice job tonight. I, I did have a question. Uh, we recognize the value of the offerings of the AP. We also recognize the amount of, the incredible amount of effort that goes into presenting new offerings. Um, the social studies department has really been a leader in the, in the world of AP for New Canaan, but I'm wondering how we're going to progress with that. Are there new offerings coming? I know you mentioned that you're going to be um, looking at redoing some of the ones, but what about new and interesting offerings to appeal to a broader group of kids? Yeah, uh, we, I mean, we've added four courses in the last uh, year and a half now. Yeah, but that was and, like a year and a half ago. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, and, but in many, you know, AP Psychology, this is the first time we've offered it. We're also looking at what, what the impact of that is on the rest of the school and the rest of student choice uh, about courses. So uh, I would be hesitant to add immediate, anything immediately, but... Uh, there's, for example, a, there's a, a new uh, research course that's out there. Uh, I'm, I'm looking into taking that uh, a, a, t a course at Taft over the summer to find out more about that uh, AP course. Uh, other than that, we haven't been seriously considering others until we see how these play because uh, they're growing. Uh, 
we went from one section of macroeconomics, one section of micro, one section of comparative AP um, government, um, to this year we have two sections of each of those. Uh, we, we have one section of AP psychology that's fully, nearly fully subscribed this year, and I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions from students about it, uh, from sophomores about taking it in their junior year. So uh, there's a lot, there's, it still feels like there's a lot of interest and room in expanding the course we do have. Uh, in social studies, um, we offer most of the social studies courses that are out there for AP. That's great. And, I, and one other question. I think you mentioned something about the, the state framework um, encouraging U.S. history to begin after the Civil War. So where does that leave us for pre-Civil War founding fathers kind of teachings? Do you want to start on that? For I, I can school and then I'll start on up. that. They have advocated, well, they've advocated fifth grade, which is typical, to be social study, to be U.S. history. Um, and then they have in eighth grade and then at some point in the high school. They have broken it up into thirds. So you do a third of what you agree on, you know, your chunk is going to be. In fifth grade, you go to the next third of the chronology. In eighth grade, and then in high school, you do the next third. That is only one way of doing it. They're not being prescriptive. Um, in fifth grade, for example, we start fifth grade with the American Re or colonization before American Revolution, and we go through the foundation of our government. We hit a little bit of an epilogue with expansion, but not too much. Um, we have the state framework will have exploration also in that year. We feel that to do depth, that's undoable. And so we've put exploration down in, in fourth grade. So um, we will have to look to make sure that we've got some settlement pieces in there um, so we just don't arrive with explorers and that we make sure that we've talked about people that were already there and that kind of thing. But we've blended that over. That's how we've done that. In eighth grade, we've taken a thematic approach. And so we revisit, we visit um, three We've got three different units exploring three different sort of sets of themes, and we go around um, chronologically three times for that. And that's really worked out well, because we don't lock kids into, this is the only time you're going to hear about this, um, but explore it deeper. So I don't, and I've been very upfront with the people at the state, this is what we do, and this is what seems to work, and this is how and why we made this decision, and they've been very supportive. They don't mean to be prescriptive, there's local control, and we do what's best for our kids. We continue to look and revisit it, is this best? Are we going deep with our kids? Is it rigorous? Are we, um, are we making sure that students have learning that's going to put them not only on the U.S. stage, but the international stage? So we look beyond just New Canaan. Uh, but I think that we're in pretty good stead with that, at least fifth and eighth grade. And, and at the high school, uh, the AP U.S. history course has, uh, there's, there's kind of a, there's, it's fairly chronological and it's dealing with the whole scope of, of U.S. history and pre, back to pre-Columbian uh, stuff in the new requirements. Uh, for many of the U.S. history sections, I believe all of them uh, at this point, they're, they're taught thematically. So although the, the focus is on post-Civil War, there are times when we'll bounce back and back into the Founding Fathers. So for example, uh, we're looking at Reconstruction as a Bridge to Civil Rights in a unit on change in the American Studies class right now. And we're looking at models of change and effectiveness of change and w what models are out there and how do they inform our understanding of the reconstruction and the failure of reconstruction and the success in light of the success of the, the civil rights movement. But we're looking back at the founding fathers and their intentions with amending the Constitution as part of that uh, look at models of change. So while the recommendation is there and while our focus is post-Civil War, we're constantly dipping back into history and the material that, that they've covered in the middle and elementary schools. Great, thanks. Thank you. Lenny? Um, 
I remember when you were here four years ago, and um, so one of the things I, I think I'm remembering the right acronym it was it was based upon the AP history, and I think it was Persia, Persia plus, plus GT. GT. Yeah, it took me a while to remember good. it. So what I was wondering is that um, still a framework that's being used, um, and because uh, there was a lot of excitement about kind of taking that down into the elementary schools at the time, uh, and I guess you know. You need to, need to change the way it was talked about a little bit because it's pretty sophisticated. But how has that worked? It is. Well, just if For, I can address yeah, just ahead. the elementary piece of that and the middle school piece of it, it is, but it's a lens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help see. And so a teacher might not introduce it in the same way you would with an eighth grade grader, right. where they would maybe take Persia plus GT and outline um, or develop a concept map to show which of those pieces, those elements of Persia, the politics or the economics or the religion, which was the driving factor. Um, but at the elementary school, they are, I mean, it's really a cultural lens, um, taking a look at different subsets of those. So it's introduced in a different way. Um, it's more formally introduced in fifth grade, but fourth grade teachers fool with pieces of it. And at the high school, they all come in the door knowing it now. Okay. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It saved us time. And you know, we, I, still, I still do, we start with the lesson, OK, we're New Canaan. Let's do a little breakdown, Persian plus GT of New Canaan. And there, it's, it's not an issue. Uh, they, they know. And, but uh, I, I can say it is a lens, and we, we, we shape that lens to what we need it for at that moment. So for example, I mentioned today we were looking at reconstruction in American studies. Uh, we used P, E, R, and S to look at uh, so in, in sorting out and understanding some documents. So we looked politically, economically, religiously, and socially at, the re at reconstruction. The others didn't, uh, didn't fit as well with this particular examination, so it didn't make sense. So still in the junior year, we're using elements of it, but I think we use it, um, well, I guess in the same way that you'll unpack it and use it how, how you need to in the elementary and middle school, we're doing the same at the high school. But it's, it's the, the kids arrive, the students arrive in ninth grade understanding lots about it, and students from out of district, we spend a little time getting them up to speed. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, another question. If or, yeah. uh, I guess the other thing I was wondering is with uh, all the computers and all the technology we have uh, you know, in the district now, can you, uh, there's a lot more access to original documents mm -hmm. for the students. So can you describe a little bit how that has like changed your classroom from say five or 10 years ago? Uh, I mean, that's a broad question, but uh, we're always talking about the impact of technology in the district. And I know hi history is one of the no, social I, studies. It's one of the areas where I've thought it's been pretty deep. It's a, it's exciting to give another example uh, from my own teaching because that's where I can be most precise. Uh, in looking at uh, breaking down per, uh, P, E, R, and S, politically, economically, religiously, and socially, looking at uh, reconstruction, we had students out on the internet. Uh, half the students were on cell phones, some were on their iPad, uh, on their, uh, their uh, MacBooks, some were on uh, PCs that we were able to get a card of those. And we had students creating uh, uh, discussion threads where they would uh, post, say, uh, the 13th Amendment, or a text from the 13th Amendment, and then look at the implications of that in other documents they're able to find. Um, it's no longer me bringing content to the table. It's me setting up experiences as a teacher that, uh, that drive the students toward that content. And the digital piece is a big part of it, but we also have document readers in the back of the classroom that, that uh, one person in each group, group was taking out a, um, a, a, a book, The American Spirit, a, a, a book that's been used for many years in AP, AP US history. So at this point, there's a nice combination of the two going on. Um, and it, it, you know, in the, in the face of the testing coming up, maybe the computers are getting a little harder to gain access to right now. But um, it's a negotiation, and we figure out a way through it at, at this point. And the same, I would say the same thing for the middle school. We're um, also institutional members, as the high school is as well, of the Gilder Lehrman. Society for American History, and they've got wonderful resources that are accessible to teachers and students of primary sources in U.S. history, and that's been a, um, they also have a lot of professional learning experiences that um, teachers can be engaged in. So that's been a, a, a great partner. Um, we also use at middle school the Stanford Historical Group, SHEG we call it, breakout, there were so, ma so many acronyms in, in social studies and in education. But there's a lot of great 
as you mentioned, sources for primary um, source information and for texts that are accessible by teachers and students. And we certainly engage them in the middle school level in that. Um, not as much in the elementary school, but we do leverage what we can and put up and, and get them to get the students to be exploring a little but bit. But we have had first graders head off to the Historical Society. Oh, yes. Canada. Yes. So. <laughs> <And> also, <laughs> they, they make those connections, and that's where even where you get the Connecticut River Museum and the New Canaan Historical Society and some of those. We go to the Fairfield Museum and partner with some of those museums that provides that kind of resource for our younger learners. And one, one of the... The, I think the interesting things that happens at the high schools, they come in and there's this intense work with the library media specialist librarians to get the students looking at databases. And, and, and we, you know, we introduce them to one after another freshman year. But as freshman and sophomore year go on, they become more and more independent in their choices about what they're going to use, why they're going to use it. And part of every assignment is defending and thinking about why does this source make sense for this project or this uh, assignment. And you know, in, in, by the junior year, students submit uh, bibliographies to us. We sit down with them and we, we have a conversation about uh, sources still and, and how can you improve the sources here and where are you going to get them. But the, the neat piece is seeing them become savvy about uh, using digital media and the internet and, and everything. And it's, I mean, it's a, it's a regular piece of class um, discussion that works nicely in hand with all these standards and frameworks that talk about students discriminating one source from another and, and looking at point of view and authors that, we're getting better and better at working with students and doing that, I think. Right. Deanna? I wanted to ask, uh, my second question earlier was um, more around the budget, since we're in that time of year. And you mentioned um, that money for travel to get to sort of some of these, I don't know if they were AP classes or things like sure, that. Sure, AP conferences. AP classes. conferences. Sort of, Going into this year, were you able to get into the conferences that you wanted? Are there things that you didn't get to do or that, that you're being restrained from doing that, you know, I think we as a district really value um, our educators getting out and seeing what's out there and what's best practices and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we want to make sure that the money is in the budget for our teachers and counselors and everybody else to to be getting out there and doing those things. So I would love to get your feedback as to what you're feeling. Then. In, in the past two years, when we have added a new AP course, mm -hmm. we have been able to get support from the district to, to go to these week-long classes at, say, Taft. Um, I, there are teachers who have independently funded those those courses in several cases that I know of. Uh, in some cases, it, they didn't ask for funding. They did it on their own. Um, in, so I, I, I don't know that we've been told no about funding, but uh, no. <laughs> we've been careful about what we ask. You know, yeah. we ask for things that we need right. and, and when and we need I, them. I think when we started to expand the AP program a few years ago, we did make a commitment to when we had a new AP course for the teacher of that course to support him or her to go to the conference. And the training Bob's talking about, it is a week long or sometimes two week long experience that's five, five or 10 days, intense eight, 10 hour days. And they're working with other teachers, typically a master teacher who's identified by the college board will be the one who's teaching it to them. And they'll be going through the syllabus and going through the units. So it is, uh, and it, they do them at Taft. They do them up in Vermont at a couple of colleges up there. I'm sure they do them in other places, but in we fact, tend to use Taft, I think, often. In fact, uh, Dr. Schneider, Lenore Schneider, travels all over the world teaching these conferences at this point. Sure. So we, but we did set a sort of, an expectation that if we're going to open a new class, that that teacher should be able to experience that training and go through it. And now I, what we're also seeing is continued interest in folks who've been teaching for a while because the, some of the expectations are changing, so providing support for them. Um, but I don't, I don't recall ever saying that. No, no. <laughs> no, that's it. And, but, but what we have now is we have teachers who are not teaching the course, not scheduled to teach the course, but are very much interested in that education, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. either for hopefully teaching it down the road, or because they want to help prepare their Global 1, Global 2 students mm -hmm. for those high expectations that we have for performance in those courses. Mm -hmm. 
I think what you've also been trying to say, also, we, we hope that when there, we will be able to be able to have money there that will be a funding to be able to make this happen. I think that's what the board is saying, that they'd like to support this. And uh, we're hoping that the implications of some of the cuts that we may sustain will not interfere with that. We'd like to have that continue. I think that's the summary of the message. And continue to ask. Yes. Agree. Make okay. sure yes. to ask. Thank you. Yes, Penny? I just wanted to say, I think this incredibly important work that you're all doing, um, it uh, touches, you know, the kids, uh, obviously, and, and it's, it's really, a lot of times, at least with my sons, it was what sparked them and their interest to learn how to write. Um, and I now have a PhD student in political science, and I think it's due to the, what he learned at New Canaan High School. Um, so just keep at it, and if you need resources, come back to us. I think you're doing fantastic work. I'm so excited that you came and updated us today, because I've kind of been waiting for four years. Yeah, you too remember the acronym. <laughs> I just want to say I know both of you have taught and coordinated here for many years in our school system, and you demonstrated again tonight why we're so lucky to have you. Um, and I wanted to also mention the, um, I was really pleased to hear that you're spending some additional time, additional effort on that transition from eighth to ninth grade, because we all know it's such a tricky time um, for children, but more so for parents, um, to navigate kind of entering into that AP environment, and especially with all the pressure there is now. Uh, that a lot of the parents, until they get into that environment, think, you know, more is better. Um, and not that more isn't better, but it's only better if it's appropriate. So I think it's great. I think that's time and effort that's, that's well spent. Um, I did have a question, though. I wanted to ask you, had mentioned multiple times about curriculum writing and curriculum revision. And sometimes it sounds like some of it is self-initiated and some of it is due to kind of outside forces like AP. Can you talk a little bit about the time that's involved in that? And I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's a whole spectrum. But I'm trying to get some idea in terms of what the effort is when you're asked to revise a curriculum or to write a curriculum for some of these new courses. Uh, speaking to the US history, that is our most intense recent uh, effort. Um, Mr. Rothman and Mr. Webb uh, led that uh, three years ago and two, or four years ago and three years ago. And it was several full days of a team of, I think, eight or eight or ten of us um, discussing, negotiating, unpacking the standards, the frameworks, um, brainstorming, and then and writing and rewriting. Uh, it was, you know, several days and then bringing that back to the department. And, and then it goes from there because you, you leave that UBD process with a, the template similar to what you, you have here. And that's just the beginning, because then you need to break it down into what does this look like in the classroom now that we have these, the, these questions, big questions and goals. Um, and then that's, that's an ongoing process for uh, throughout every year. Because even when you have those student expectations, whatever the grade level is, then you see it in practice, there may be some more revision or tweaking along the line. So it can be summer work, but now as Bob has mentioned, a lot of it's really integrated into our practice. Where do we capture time at a, at a team meeting to take a look at that? You know, that topical understanding sort of says what we wanted kids to do, but now that we're looking at it, maybe we need to just rephrase that to make sure that we're really strategic and targeting. And those essential questions worked really well, but I'm seeing the kids aren't really applying it to, to current life. Let's make sure that we, what instructional maneuvers or strategies can we use to get there? So it becomes curriculum revision, but it really comes to life when it gets in, in the hands of teachers and really gets to be manifest with all of the students. And that's where we really get to see what works, what doesn't, and what kind of tweaking we need to do. And there was a time uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, where you would be handed these projects during the summer and said, go write civics. And uh, that it's not effective. You need the you need the team of a team of people, a team of teachers who are working on the course, who can bounce ideas off of each other, and that's been a major shift in, and and I think one of the reasons that we've moved some of that curriculum writing to the school year and, and during the school day and after school, and those summer projects are still important, but I, I'm those work best too when it's a team of teachers working on it. Thank you. Any other questions? I just wanted to uh, build upon some of the things that people have said, how important it is what you're doing. And we think about now, particularly as we look at the world situation, 
and learning about countries and politics, and I look at Persia, the whole list is right there of what we need to understand to be able to deal and work with other countries and be successful and uh, be able to bring about peaceful solutions and thoughtful solutions. So it's a terrific job you're doing, and thank you to the teachers that are doing it with you and to you both for your leadership on it. Thank you. Greatly thank appreciated. You. Thank you. And uh, feel free. We understand that you need to be back early in the morning, that it's okay to leave after you're finished. Okay. Thank you. Thank you much. And now move to the next part of our agenda. And I see they're moving. Are they doing the agenda? Anything about the check? Uh, yeah, we'll do the budget update first. Yes. Don't be just getting I saw them leaving. Okay. Thank you. Great. So our next next item on our agenda is a brief budget update. Um, the we've been having meetings with different with the uh, board of finance for the last couple of weeks, and just thought that it would be a good idea just to uh, share a very quick update, sort of so everyone understands where we are at this point prior to tomorrow night's board of finance vote. Um, Nancy's put together a document that um, she can talk us through very quickly, if that's all right. Okay, um, well, obviously um, the budget process is always an exciting process from start to the cliffhanger finish, and we're only about two-thirds of the way through. Uh, what I, I was getting some questions, and in my own mind, I really needed to organize uh, the framework of what all of the Board of Selectmen and then the uh, Board of Finances discussions were and how they translated into our bottom line. So I just broke out our various budgets, the operating budget, the facilities capital budget, the technology capital budget, and then the transportation capital budget uh, because uh, during all of our meetings, the discussions tend to flow and ebb and move back and forth kind of like wave action. And so uh, uh, what I did was to try and first capture the Board of Selectmen uh, where really the question came uh, to remove SACs from the board's regular capital budget request. So you see that in the second column called facilities capital, we started out with $12,345,000. So you'll see that negative 10132 That doesn't mean it has been reduced. It is simply the pause button and that the uh, Sachs Building Committee will be coming back through to address not only the Board of Education, the Selectmen, the Board of Finance, and ultimately the Town Council, uh, not in the course of the operating budget and the other capitals, but as a standalone. So that's what that represents, not as a cut, but simply moving it out from the normal discussion. You also see that the uh, South parking lot was removed, and that occurred uh, during that discussion with the selectmen, and then, of course, the, ten, uh, the Board of Finance has continued that assumption. Uh, again, the Board of Finance uh, does not add back to the Board of Selectmen, just as when the Board of Finance votes tomorrow evening, uh, our whole budget discussion will move on to the Town Council. The town council cannot add money to our budget. They can reduce the budget. So again, it, it tends to be an iterative process. So uh, the discussions also um, at the selectmen level was uh, to remove from our FY16 facilities capital uh, the requests listed here, the security phase two, the east curb repair replacement, the south playground, it's really the south playground hill, uh, and the west gym floor replacement, and the west walkway curb 
repair replacement. All of these are issues of safety and concern. And so the selectmen felt as though uh, they really needed to fund those now rather than holding out for the whole FY16 process. Uh, so that brought our facilities capital down to $918,500. Then at the Board of Finance uh, meeting of the, uh, February 24th, you'll notice again under the column total, titled operating, the pool $80,000 that we had budgeted uh, was removed from the board's operating budget and placed in a contingency account on the town side so that it wouldn't factor into any taxing responsibilities, but still uh, there is a potential obligation, but it's not a known obligation. It's dependent on what happens at the Y. Uh, the project work was uh, removed from our operating budget and moved into facilities capital. So it didn't disappear, it simply moved to a different uh, category. The added rental space, at that moment, uh, we had been told by the current owner of 39 Locust that uh, no transactions would be taking place in terms of any open spaces and rentals of that. So you can see the reduction of the $30,000. Uh, the staff turnover was a discussion, again, that took place uh, fairly extensively with most of the Board of Finance. And ultimately, the discussion was, and obviously no actions have been taken yet, uh, that $240,000 uh, would be removed. Uh, and again, I should caution they're articulating where it should come from. However, everyone clearly understands that the Board of Education receives a single line appropriation for each, uh, for the operating budget. The Board of Finance and the Town Council can specify for all of the three capital budgets. They can add, uh, they can delete, modify, by project. It's the operating budget that they have a one line item appropriation. So uh, again, we have some concerns, although we've built in uh, the anticipation of the additional needs for staff at SACS, along with one additional undesignated section at the elementary schools. However, this reduction could potentially impact the superintendent's uh, flexibility uh, should kindergarten classes continue to rise, should uh, more first graders come in than had been in our kindergarten program. So there's a little bit of concern there. Um, and then lastly, under operating, you'll see that $1.1 million. We had budgeted the full anticipated $11.6 million of anticipated claims. Uh, at, that, at that point in time when the Board of Education uh, approved their proposed budget, it was decided to have the discussion with the Board of Finance and the impact of the newly identified and articulated policy on health benefits and the reserve, uh, where the Board has 60% responsibility and the town has 40% responsibility. That $1.1 million represents the translation, the discussion, and bringing it into that policy framework. Um, so at this point in time, our operating budget on the floor of uh, the Board of Finance is $83,300,121. Uh, clearly, it's not over till it's over. Uh, so uh, we will all go ready to answer any more questions, uh, speak to any issues on the operating. Um, moving over to the facilities, again, um, 
we had ended uh, 224 meeting at 803,500, 803,500 uh, dollars. And that represented a reduction of the $150,000 of painting. And that was a direct action uh, because as we had to deal with a transfer of $120,000 out of painting, then the Board of Finance had said, this is too important. We are going to move money. We are going to transfer money back into that line item. So that 150 was in recognition of receiving the $120,000 uh, of refilling that particular project item. Uh, and in addition, showing the increase of the $59,000 of project work moved from operating into capital. Then on the 26th, um, under facilities, we were asked to really look deep uh, to see if there were any other suggestions that we could make for reducing uh, the facility's capital. Uh, since we are doing so much work over at South School, um, Bob Willoughby had indicated that we probably wouldn't be able to do uh, anything more over at that school. So uh, we volunteered the $150,000 of masonry work uh, at South School for this summer and uh, with the understanding that we will be moving that into next year and I think there was $100,000 uh, in next year's that will move out to FY17, I'm sorry, FY18, uh, moving along. Uh, in addition, um, what we have, uh, what Brian and I have talked about with the first selectman was to collapse all of the remaining masonry work into a district-wide, removing it school by school. We've got uh, $50,000 in design professional under system-wide, and so that gives us more flexibility of kind of targeting what the highest need areas are from one line item rather than uh, uh, either having to go for transfers if the dollars are different, and uh, the first selectman was supportive of that, uh, and I believe that the uh, Board of Finance will act on that. Then um, technology, we had, uh, because there had been so much discussion prior to uh, us submitting to the town our technology budget, there was discussion on whether we should lease uh, as we had been doing over the years, or at this point in time, begin to purchase outright. So we showed the lease purchase process, and then on a separate page, showed the costs strictly for purchasing the new slash replacement, along with the elementary uh, infrastructure upgrade, along with the two portable uh, labs for SACS. Uh, that totaled $1,118,932. Uh, after the discussion on the 26th, it was universally felt by the Board of Finance that leasing was still the way we would go. Uh, so we resorted back to the uh, $989,008 uh, for the existing three leases, the new one quarter of the roughly $800,000 lease, so $200,000, again with the elementary upgrade and the SACS to portable labs. Uh, we received tremendous pressure at our uh, at last uh, week's Board of Finance to continue to cut, to find reductions. Uh, but before I go there, last but not least, transportation. Uh, we had requested four purchase of vehicles. 
again, the discussion was of uh, such a nature, recognizing that the changing of the methodology for all the years that we have had special ed uh, vans, they have been leased out of our operating budget. Uh, we were requested to change the methodology. We had enough money in our operating budget to issue a purchase order for one vehicle. So we're already behind three vehicles this year. And I think in recognition of that, uh, the selectmen and the Board of Finance have determined that we should uh, have that current funded so that as soon as those funds are approved, uh, we can issue a purchase order for four more vehicles. Uh, and that's really an issue of safety of our children. So getting back to what we anticipate uh, as a concern coming up for tomorrow evening, I think the continued pressure from the Board of Finance to find additional cuts, and of course because the Board of Education is the largest aspect of all town budgets, certainly in New Canaan, that's also true. Uh, I believe that there, it's expected, and I'll stop in just one second and turn it over to Brian, but my assumption is that the pressure will continue to focus in on the board's budgets and uh, cuts, whether they are informed cuts or arbitrary cuts, uh, based on, I think, a tax rate. So I'll turn it back over to Brian. Okay. So we received a couple of questions today from the Board of Finance, um, specifically looking at technology and the requests for technology in the budget. Uh, they were looking, the questions focused on the $800,000 of new equipment that we're looking to purchase using the leasing agreement. So it's a $200,000 payment. Uh, per year over the four years for that equipment, which is consistent with the practice that we've had for a while. Um, they did ask about impacts of, of cuts to that um, and some prioritization, but as I explained to them, you know, the, the budget that goes forward when it does go come to the Board of Ed and, and go to the Board of Selectmen, Board of Finance, is not what, they were using the term wish list, and I'll explain that it's not a wish list. This actually is the result of months of work to start with sort of a big list of requests and get to a point where uh, we can continue to support the program, move it forward in some targeted areas, but by no means is it sort of everything in the kitchen sink all thrown in. It was, it's a finely honed and, and cold list that um, you know, we're comfortable bringing forward and saying these are what our needs are to maintain and to, to continue moving forward. So we will have the answer to those questions prior to the meeting tomorrow. Um, as soon as they're available, I'll certainly share them with the board as well. Um, and look forward to a, a another lively discussion. Are there, are there questions or discussion points that the board had about this, Scott? I just have one quick question: the um, the pool contingency. Are we assured that should we need should the YMCA close and we need a swimming pool for the swim teams that the town will fund that? Yes. And to whatever extent it is, whether it's 80 or less or more, or? Uh, they move the contingency from the board's operating to the town designated specifically at 80,000 uh, for the pool. So again, uh, it. And that, well, that number is, is pretty solid. I think We've is. done quite a bit of work to be right. sure that that would, would meet the needs of our program. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, Penny? So I just want to, want to confirm with the um, if we take the suggestion on the health benefit reduction line item for 1.1 million and we take that out so we are basically underfunding this year by 1.1 million our expected claims for next year we'll need to get that money out of our reserves that's correct so uh, then with that uh, you know assuming that that's uh, the money that we take out of the reserves do we then still, uh, under the formula and under the agreement with the town bodies, still have the 60% in our reserves, the 60% left to cover the full aggregate stop loss quarter, or are we exposed in the aggregate stop loss quarter? 
Would you like to answer? Dion is our I, I chair of our resource committee. Yeah, we've been we've been doing a lot of uh, work on this in the last week as as a resource committee, and um, you know I. I, I'll share this maybe afterwards with all of you in, in more detail, but um, if, if I look at, <clears throat> based on, on the equity in the account, it looks like if they take out 1.1 in the, in the health benefit account, that, that reserve um, percentage drops to 29%. So we are, we are underfunded, we are not, we are not um, fulfilling the goals of the policy, um, even at, at the suggested 1.1 uh, million dollar level. So there would have to be um, a discussion about that policy bef before the end of the budget season because I, it, it, um, I think there was... So what is the amount of, mm -hmm. uh, of cut we could uh, withstand and still keep our 60 percent of the expected 25 percent corridor? Okay, I don't have my Excel spreadsheet with me, but I will. <laughs> um, we would probably have to, so we need to get to 60 percent, so let me just Hold on, you guys, why don't you ask a yes. few more questions? How about if we go to another question while she works on that? Does anybody have another one, Allison? She had a question, but there's just one thing I wanted to bring to the attention of any of the board members who weren't um, at all the meetings, and it was something that came up that was of uh, concern to me, and it has to do with what we're talking about, which is that policy from the from the town. And I know we had a lot of discussion last year because we've made some pretty severe changes to our health insurance policy to meet the budget um, at the suggestion of the town. And the policy was written last year. I think we both decided we needed something to make us, both parties, comfortable. So this particular um, agreement was written. This policy was written. My concern, um, and maybe this was just happened that night. We won't hear it again. My concern was when there was a suggestion made by one of the Board of Finance members to take out more than the 1.1. Um, that it was brought by the budget director brought to the attention of the Board of Finance that that was going to put them in direct conflict with the policy. And the response from, I think it was actually the first selectman who was chairing it, was, well, we'll just rewrite the policy. So my concern is this policy was written to give us comfort and so that we would kind of guarantee we would have an arrangement going with the town. My concern is if there's going to be that much willingness to just rewrite the policy to meet whatever the budget numbers are that they're proposing to us, then to me it doesn't give me a lot of faith in the policy. So I think it's just something we need to talk about and just be careful as a board, because um, I felt much more comfortable making those cuts to our health insurance um, based on that written policy. But if, in fact, there's going to be a willingness to change that written policy, I'm not going to say on an annual basis, but it was only written last spring. Okay, so I mean, the ink's barely dry. And they're already talking about potentially, or had mentioned potentially revising that to meet the numbers they wanted to hit, not necessarily what they had agreed um, with us. So that really put up a, a red flag to me. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. And we should incorporate, I think, that um, thought in our discussions about health insurance. Now, again, maybe we'll never hear that um, again, hopefully not. Um, but I, I was just, I was very concerned about it. Okay, I have some numbers. Okay, we'll, go, we'll switch yeah. back again. Thank Sorry, you, Allison. Scott, to That's answer your point. question. It's, um, now, you have to remember that this is in anticipation of, you know, the budgeted numbers that we're anticipating right now. So I have to go back to this year because we are. So if you think about in this current year, <clears throat> we've underfunded health care coverage by over 900, you know, I have $924,897. So if that happens, if there's no further deterioration or, you know, the budgeted health care things come in as they're expected, if all of what we predict happens, then next year, um, to stay at the 60% um, threshold, they could only take another $50,000, $49,472. Based on our budgeted, um, you know, but based on our budgeted numbers, so. So 60% of the 25% of the corridor. So the corridor is at uh, two, for next year is anticipated, right. the stop loss corridor for next year is anticipated at $2,989. Okay, so 60% of that um, quarter means we need um, an equity balance of uh, 1, 400. Um But so um, that gives it, based on the cash balances and the drawdown with that, um, that's over a million dollars more than what we'll have at, at, at the end of 2015-16. I'm talking about next year, but so uh, with the the next year's budget taking 1.1 million. So you're talking about 
because it's making one point one million a year out of the fifteen sixteen budget. Yes, because that's what's being proposed by the board of finance. And we'll have reserves that year, or we won't have reserves that year to cover the. We will have not the court. We will have reserves, the, so we will have reserves. So, like, just to, to back cover up. our sixty percent of the twenty, the aggregate stop loss quarter. Correct. So, but we, then you're talking about it's the next year. No, no, I'm talking about. So to be in compliance with the agreement, I think this is probably something we have to take offline because it's very detailed, mm -hmm. um, and we need to probably run through it um, together, but. Um, as it stands now, we will have um, reserves in the health account. It will not be in compliance with the policy for next year. So how? And that's the so number, and by over a million dollars. So we're so that means that we'll have we'll be so if we have to keep one million seven hundred ninety three thousand in reserves correct under the policy correct you're saying we're only going to have seven hundred ninety three thousand yes mm -hmm. yes. Yes. I think there's some implications here that need to be looked into and sure, I think uh, and, and discussed. And as you say, we need to examine this and uh, be able to make sure with yeah. Now, now we have to remember, you know, the whole justification. I, I think you're right. I mean, it's the, it's not like there isn't money there. There is. A, it's just that we need. It's not in compliance with the policy that was as as Allison said. It's not in compliance with the policy that was written with the town. For last year, this budgeted suggests if things play out the way, and Nancy's very good at this, so she's been very good. So, you know, I, I think you know we have to so be. So, probably the best way forward would be to for us to pull something together in writing, um, get it up to the board first thing tomorrow morning, so that uh, we can be sure that we understand and have all the numbers straight mm -hmm. and and how it works with the policy here, um, and then. Uh, probably communicate with the Board of Finance, send it to them in advance so that we could have have our discussion that night because I do think tomorrow night by charter they, they'll be voting on the budget. Right. Um, so, so this is very important for everyone to understand so that, uh, you know, because the, uh, just to play out a worst case scenario, if this cut, as Nancy mentioned before, it just comes out of the operating, I mean, they're saying that mm -hmm. they're going to move this around and fund it, but worst case would be that you know, if the funding actually doesn't come out of the reserve, then we have, would have to find this this difference somewhere else in the in the budget, which would be very, well, would be disastrous for our program. Right. So I understand the issue with rewriting the policy every year, but I would still think that we, I mean, at least by having the policy and talking about it, even if we rewrite the percentages, um, then I think the town bodies have to understand exactly what the funds that they need to be kind of holding in reserve mm -hmm. to cover the aggregate stop loss quarter. It is a restricted it, reserve, it's a on, restricted on, reserve. On, on the town side. It is a restricted reserve, uh, but again. Uh, so presumably they'll have to increase that mm -hmm. by their, us. like if our costs were going up by their 6% and then by this mm -hmm. like 1 million or whatever. So we should be, we should have that number ready to give it to the town bodies. Say if you do this and we follow your suggestion and we take it out, you need to be holding in this restricted reserve X amount of money under our current. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, Diana, Deanna has uh, uh, really crafted uh, a few things that can help distinguish between cash and mm -hmm. equity. Mm -hmm. And equity is what the policy, the reserves are talking about equity as opposed to cash. So again, it's accounting jargon. Uh, it's a balance sheet position uh, as opposed to everybody. It's easy to think about mm -hmm. having cash in the bank and there would be enough cash in the bank, mm -hmm. but you also have to look at the financial statement itself. And the policy was designed to reference the equity piece, aka the reserve balance uh, as opposed to the cash. So it is not a simple discussion. I think it's an important one. It sounds like Dion is going to provide us with information to be able to discuss this and understand it better. And I, I think it's something that we need to make sure that we do it because otherwise we're going to be having difficulties. 
I think there's some other things too. Penny, I see your hand. I well, just... I guess on this insurance, since um, I always felt kind of comfortable when we had mm -hmm. maybe two million and we were on the Board of Ed side covering a significant part of the aggregate stop loss mm -hmm. corridor. I understand, you know, if the town bodies think, you know, they're behind us and full faith and credit of New Canaan, which is excellent. Um, but I think, do we need to add to this policy something that shows, like, at what point we kind of go tap into those town reserves and they transfer them over? So that there's no, so we all understand. I mean, because exactly. at, with, uh, as I understand the way health insurance works, when we go over, we just kind of are, uh, they just tap our account. That is correct. It. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we find that we're uh, getting kind of close and getting close to the aggregate stop loss corridor uh, that might and happen. we need a cushion in case there's a claim and, you know, we can't wait two or three weeks or a month mm -hmm. to go through town bodies, what's going to be the mechanism? Well, that's why we had the 60% and why we felt comfortable with that. that right, gave but then us the question time. is how they... I understand. Right, with the 60%, we with had you 100%, time. Yeah. Right, but now now we don't have 60%. Now it sounds like we have about 20%. Yeah, 30%. I think 30%. 29%. I think yeah. Brian was uh, has sent the letter of agreement. We were talking about that going to the attorneys and to also... It sounds like this needs to be also added into what goes, the agreement, the written agreement, just exactly what you're saying, and what does delay uh, we've had in that contract. It says uh, that the money will be provided without delay, but there's no specific amount of time, and I think those are the things we had discussed, and also that I think that they are going to, are, if not already looking at, are going to be looking at. And, and do we just have to go back to the Board of Finance because it's yes. a specified reserve, so we don't have to It go to specifically the board does say that it's, it's a transfer from the Board of Finance, and then the, the Board, board of, of Finance okay. would inform the other town bodies about it, but it was not an appropriation. It, it, it is even more finely crafted than that because it's a transfer from the town to the Board of Education with a notice to the Board of Finance at, to their next meeting of the transfer. The transfer is between the uh, town and the Board of Education, uh, and then the transfer after the fact is approved by the Board of Finance as an informational item, which is an important piece. Uh, it is not waiting for the next Board of Finance meeting to do the transfer. It's a notice to inform of the transfer by the CFO. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. So, I just so that's a really important yes, piece. Yes, it is, because that's the timing on it. I think we have also some other issues that I, I'm concerned that I wanted to raise and ask. What are the implications on the technology that we have? You had mentioned about how carefully and exactly all of the pieces of equipment and everything that we were asking for had been determined. Mm -hmm. Now, it sounds as if some of that equipment is going to be pulled back and not put in place, or possibly is being discussed that way. What will be the implications programmatically? Where will those be cut, and what effect will it have on those students? Sure. The, uh, in some of the planning, as we looked at the new equipment with technology, uh, it was, we were guided by our desire to provide access to all of the classes and all of the grades, uh, so that it could be, it could be used by, by the teachers in those classes when it was most relevant and important in their curriculum as they're doing it. Um, if we were to not, if we were to cut back on purchasing some of that equipment, I think we we lose the ability to to integrate it in that to that degree with our classes. Um, we also um, it hampers us a bit in some of our assessment practices as we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Uh, that the right what we're looking to do is set it up so that as we go through our, our assessments both uh, standardized and local assessments that we can do that in a way that the feedback is timely and can inform instruction uh, quickly across the grades and in the classrooms uh, and if we have to scale back on that that will hurt us as well or slow down our implementation of that a bit uh, there are there are some costs in there for projector replacements and and things like that, where we're we're still we're spending money now, and operationally through bulbs and repairs, as the projectors go, the bulbs tend to go quicker, which and they're very expensive replacements. Um, so we're better off replacing those projectors in the long run, sort of pay one way or the other. Um, 
and that would slow down on those those replacements. Uh, and also, if one were to go in classroom that we didn't have the replacement ready, um, they could be without for for a bit, which is something that you know again we mm -hmm. it's so integrated in the practices and the work that we do now that. Uh, and for the most part, these are used daily. So these it are the projectors, down the, the projectors, smart boards. The smart boards in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any other questions that anybody has to ask? I thank you very much. That's, uh, it sounds like it's multi-grades that are going to be affected then. Is it that would that be, sure. Elementary and middle? Yeah, prob well it probably, unfortunately, would be elementary more because we're doing mm -hmm. some significant, more significant work there with this year's tech mm -hmm. lease. Um, we still we do have machines that are going they're they're aging out and uh, and we're looking to replace and bring in desktops that can run the systems and programs that we have um, but it does the majority if you look at the uh, the breakout the majority does tend to be in the three elementaries okay thank you and the other penny I want you to know I haven't dropped this issue we're going to continue this and have lots more come back on this on what we're talking about the insurance it's so oh important. I had not insurance question that's <laughs> I just want to make sure I didn't want you to <laughs> Be worried about it. I'm worried about it, and we're going to continue the discussion and and um, make sure that it covers the things that we all are looking for to be covered in, in the program. I'm glad you brought it up. That's Penny. Yes. Uh, so um, I'm I'm just looking at the, um, the the staff requirements, and I'm wondering we have a kindergarten is always our our big unknown. So I know we've started kind of we've already started our enrollment efforts mm -hmm. for next year. And are the, how has anybody compared uh, how we're doing there uh, compared to how we did the last couple of years? Do does it look like our uh, to the extent that we know now? Does it look like our projections for next year uh, are kind of in line with where we were? I mean, I, you don't know till the you know till the right. Right. class September. starts. September. Right. So what I can say right now is probably the three elementary schools are, are probably looking at about five sections each. Um, one school is still teetering between four or five sections, but we're closely monitoring those numbers because um, we just sent out a reminder to those parents who've done the pre-registration asking them um, to complete the full registration process. So it's a process that they go through um, by the end of March because the end of March is when we'll send out our kindergarten orientation letters for April. So it's kind of another push to encourage people to come down to central office and register their child. They don't need to bring health forms, but they do need to bring their proof of residency and their birth certificates. So right now we're, we're tracking those numbers very carefully. Um, if I was to look at where the numbers were last year at this time, we're probably about the same, um, but it's really becomes very unpredictable from April to August. And we're closely monitoring second grade numbers um, because that happens to be the classes across the district that are slightly over guidelines now. So we're continuing to monitor those numbers real carefully. Um, it's a tricky time of the year because we're still looking to see who may be withdrawing their children and then who's enrolling their children. So it's a time where we'll send out letters to people that if they know that they're gonna be moving for the upcoming school year to please notify their, their building principals so that we can um, complete withdrawal paperwork for those students and, and start to get a better sense of what our sections will be at each of the elementary schools. So without the staff turnover money, what would we do? We, if it came up higher, I'm throwing that out into the conversation. What would happen? What would be the implications of? Well, sure. As um, Nancy mentioned earlier, the, you know, that, that reduction in that, the, the salary account, uh, what that does is it starts to restrict our flexibility and our ability to be responsive to changing conditions throughout the district. Uh, the, as you know, this uh, last summer we had to hire a couple of teachers just late in the summer uh, because we do try to manage it in such a way that uh, when we make that decision, we've, we're pretty confident that it's the right one. You know, we, so we wait to make sure, as, as Dr. Cranty mentioned, it's such a fluctuating number as you go up and approach the first day of school. Um, so as reductions occur in that, in that area, uh, it does, it can begin to, to limit our ability to be responsive to changing conditions such as that. Uh, we do have, as, as Nancy mentioned in the budget, we've got the two teachers at SACS and we do have one elementary teacher because as we've looked at the projections, it does indicate that we'll, we'll at least need that. You know, so we felt comfortable going forward with that. 
Um, but certainly, as again, we saw just this last summer, it's, it's a moving target until that first day of school. And when that bell rings on the first day, you hope that you, you have everybody you need to make it all work. Because the, as we know, the, the class side gu size guidelines that we have are that important for us to really do everything we can to maintain. So we um, seem to be at the top end of those guidelines in most of our sections. We are. So we either exceed our guidelines or try to find the money in another area and suffer that way. That's Allison, did I see your hand go up? Well, I was going to say, I think sometimes, too, there's a misconception, and I know we've tried to talk about this every year, um, but we're having a hard time, I think, getting over this bump, um, where sometimes people on some of the boards will add up, oh, you had six retirements last year, you're hiring six in new people, they'll take the differential between an ending salary and a starting salary and say that's kind of an arbitrary cut. Um, and I think anybody who goes to, to the new teacher orientation, you don't see a room full of 22-year-olds sitting around those tables. And so I think we have to be, I'm really concerned about cutting almost a quarter of a million dollars out of our salary line. And honestly, it's relatively arbitrary, I think, in terms of the, the rationale behind it. Um, and I think we just need to keep that in mind because combine that with the flexibility that, that Dr. Lutze was just talking about, where I know multiple years we've had to hire between one and three teachers at the end of the summer. Um, and you combine that with the fact that you may end up hiring, you may have somebody leave the school system who is then replaced by someone at a higher salary. Nobody factors that in. So um, I just want to say that I am concerned about that quarter million dollars, very much so. Well, I think when we think about also that the idea we will be able to decide about on money um, where we would pull this, but as Dr. Litzy has said, we've already, they staff all of the teachers and have already looked at the various things in the budget and have gotten down to the bare bones when you came to us. And that means that it's not going to be easy to pull this out. If we have to do, just as you're outlining, that we need another teacher, that salary will have to come from something that's already been gotten down to the point that it can't be pulled. And that's right. I think remembering that the, uh, the budget itself, over 81% of the budget is already in salary and benefits. So you're looking at 19% that covers everything else. Um, and then you, you've got electricity and transportation and other things that sort of eat that up pretty quickly. So you know, finding that extra money where, where if it were to happen that way uh, could be quite the challenge. Are there any questions that anybody else has about these various you know, you parts? Know, I would make a quick comment, if not a question at all. And that is that while um, I think it's reasonable to be um, disappointed and I think it's reasonable to be depressed over this quarter of a million dollar cut, there is no reason that I can find to be surprised. I mean, this is, a, this is a kind of a thing that we have um, experienced year after year after year, which is a cut in our budget that is arbitrarily handed to us in the matter of hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it has begun to take its toll on the product that we're going to produce. And the town needs to understand it, and they need to uh, appreciate it. So when, when we don't have the kind of technology for kids in the future years that, that we require, these are the moments you can point to. Yes, Allison. I just want to say, I'm hoping tomorrow night at the Board of Finance meeting that, that Jim Kacharsik is going to be able to attend that because Jim, is the, uh, Jim has the added, uh, I would say, talent of having had the experience on the Board of Education, and he's also um, very up on his technology. So the combination of the two is he's a good person to look for, I think, for the Board of Finance members to look to um, in terms of kind of getting uh, advice or information in terms of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I think the original meeting two meetings ago when the tech budget was introduced to the Board of Finance, there was tremendous discussion about it. And we all left that meeting with the feeling that everybody was comfortable having heard from Jim um, and everyone else on the Board of Finance. I think that, that we all felt uh, left and they left feeling they were comfortable with the number. I was surprised to walk into the last meeting last week. Uh, and unfortunately, Mr. Kacharsik was not able to attend. Um, and there was a real push to start cutting uh, technology. Fortunately, some of the members spoke up and said they weren't comfortable without Jim being there to make severe cuts or serious cuts in it. Um, but there still was a push for that. So I'm hoping tomorrow night we'll be able to have a rational conversation because I think we're all concerned about just taking money out of technology. There's a plan in place. This plan has been developed for over a decade at this point in time. So just to pull arbitrary money out, um, I don't think it makes sense for our plan. I think it's very harmful to what the district's trying to do. I'm hoping also there'll be a dialogue because there were several things that there was a dialogue and I think there were some things that the 
Board of Finance was looking at, trying to look at with a new eye, and I'm hoping, trying to be optimistic that they will again tomorrow night think about those things and the things we brought up and, and understand where this budget comes from, starting from our goals, how many months go into the planning of it, and the thoughtful process of all the things that have been taken out, all the things that are left are really important things, and we'd like to have them to continue to make the outstanding school system that we have. Deanna? I just, I think it's important for people um, when they hear the dollars that are potentially being taken out of um, out of our lease uh, obligate or our, our leasing arrangements is that it, it's almost a four time, you know, you can multiply it by almost four, and and that's how much technology that'll purchase. So you know, if you're taking fifteen thousand out, you're almost taking sixty thousand dollars out of your technology purchases for the district. So you know, I mean, you know, uh, the two hundred thousand dollars of of lease purchases or the leasing that we were going to do, but eight hundred thousand dollars worth of technology for the district. It's it's a huge um, benefit, a very low financing rate. I mean, it's you know it's one you know I think Jim even said it's like one percent. Yes. It's it's very cost efficient um, for the district to do this, and and any cut that they make. Um, is, has big ramifications for the district. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it does, and and I think people have to keep that in mind when they when they use small numbers because sometimes mm -hmm. it's easy to say a small number, but it it, it means a lot to the district. So, so fifteen thousand really equals about six, 15 times four sixty. So. so that's a lot. Yeah. That's cut out of the, out of yeah. the technology. Penny. Well, I guess I just want to say I, I was um, in terms of the technology what I. What I think is also important on that is that this is the investment in the future, mm -hmm. and that this is what we're using to leverage uh, education to actually save money in other areas. I mean, for example, if we had not done the technology upgrades at SACS at the mm -hmm. high school, uh, education would be kind of at a lower level uh, because students wouldn't be able to be getting on the internet as we heard, uh, you know, it was happening in social studies. And we also wouldn't be able next year to turn two classrooms to the um, computer classrooms into actual homeroom classrooms uh, because we can put those computers on carts. So I think that there is this, uh, our investment in the technology I think reaps a lot of benefits to the district in terms of other uh, awards, uh, rewards. I think eventually we might start seeing some textbook costs come down as we get more and more uh, computers into the classroom. Not sure how that's gonna work out, but um, you know, it's it's uh, certainly the wave of the future, and if we uh, we need to keep driving that train forward, so we can uh, keep up with the uh, highest districts in the United States. When I watch the fifth and sixth graders that I've seen using the technology, I'm talking about how even the youngest children, and also been in the elementary schools, and see how they use it in education, and how important it is. It's, it's very surprising, it, and it's a really tremendous payoff that we get back on it. The idea that students in the middle school do get their assignments from the computer, they then do their assignments, get them back to the teacher, and it's a, a seamless operation to, to watch. And there's a very new way of doing it, I think, than for many people who are trying to examine and say, what is technology doing today? I know that's your specialty, so I, I, I only speak from the, what I've seen. You know we've seen everything that's happened with it and the best of it. So sure. well, I know that for the thoughts you have for us. Oh, sure. Well, I, mean, I think we heard from Bob and Mary also, yes. you know, how important it was. It just, and they didn't, they didn't have a slide on how we're using technology. Mm -hmm. what you, did, you heard how it was integrated into their daily practice, into yes. the work that they do. And that's been our goal. You know, that's how we approach it, that it's, it's not an add-on or something that you sort of, we all, all right, we're all gonna do our technology unit now, but instead it really is a part of the practice, a part of the learning experience. And yeah, it, we, we have been planful with this through the years. And if you look ahead in the next couple of years, as we've, we've shown in the budget projections, we expect the curve to come down a little bit in some of the costs on the technology because of you know, the investments we're making now and the way that we're able to manage that. And if we start to, again, you start, it's like a Jenga puzzle. You start to play with it a little bit and take a little out, a little here, a little there. Uh, what you're left with is you know, a pile you've got to start rebuilding from scratch again. And uh, you know, the, while we're not quite at that point, what we're doing is sort of taking, a, moving away some of the parts that you know, we've come, we're looking, we're planning on and counting on going forward and that have been identified as needs mm -hmm. for us. So I do feel it's important for us to, 
to do this. And as Deanna, to your point, you know, when, if we're looking at $800,000 of spending money in the lease this year, that cost us $200,000 know, over each of the next four years. So you know, if we reduce that number by the $800,000 know, by $40,000, uh, it's a pretty big hit in the spending it's a $10,000 savings per year, you know, to make that trade off. And so I think the lease is a, is a, seems to be a, a positive and planful way to go ahead and make these, you know, make these purchases in order to support our program and go forward. So, um, you know, just takes a lot of thought and effort and uh, work to put something forward like this. And again, it's not prioritized because you don't see priority twos on that list. They're all they're they're all I would lines. add to that the extraordinary advances in, in the Department of Special Education with technology, which may really be more powerful in many ways than what goes on in regular education. Yeah. Are there any other comments that anyone wants to say? Nancy. And I'd just like to remind everyone that we have a five-year technology plan that was submitted to the state. It was developed over time, it's the third one that the school district will have ha has submitted, uh, and it was developed with input from all educational aspects. And so the requests continue to reflect uh, meeting uh, at least the minimum aspects of that technology plan. And that when Jill and I, Scott and Rob, and a variety of other folks met school by school. Those were parts of that discussion as well. Thank you. Yes, Allison. I know we all want to go home, but I just want to, I just want to say quickly, I think Dr. Lutze made a great point before, and I just want to reiterate it again, because um, I think what we're up against sometimes is people say, you know, what's $200,000? You can find, if I had a dime for every time that was said, you can find $200,000 in an $84 million budget. Um, and I think, um, to, to Dr. Lutze's point we were saying before, is we have so many fixed costs. Uh, we're not dealing with an $84 million budget. You know, when you actually look at what we have in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll quote discretionary, um, it's such a small percentage of what our total budget is. And if we can get people to target on that, to take a look at that and say, what are the dollars, what are the dollars that you have that are not fixed, that are not contracts, that are not all the other costs that we have? And you look at that, and it's such a small piece of the budget. And if you look at a quarter of a million dollars or $200,000 out of that small piece of the budget, it's significant. And every dollar in that piece of the budget is targeted to some Something. So if $200,000 or $50,000 or whatever the amount is, is taken out of that, something is not going to happen. Something's not going to be purchased. Somebody is not going to be hired. And I think sometimes the thought is that there's a layer on everything. So, okay, if we take $200,000, you can take a piece off of here, a piece off. No one's going to feel it. No one's going to see it. We all know how well vetted this, this uh, budget is. It's, it's very, you know, significantly vetted each year, and we understand that. So we know that nothing like that does exist. And I think it's really important that we just make people understand that, that these are real dollars that have been targeted for something real. And if we don't get those dollars, then something is not going to happen. And if the town's okay with that, then that's okay but these are not things that are going to happen and nobody's going to see. And I just think we need to, rem to remind people of that sometimes. It's going to have a real effect in, in, to what Scott just said. It's really going to impact the budget, and this has happened year after year, and you can only slice off little pieces of things so many times before something starts to crumble. And that's kind of our job is to make sure that that foundation stays, stays strong and stays stable. Thank you. Well, I think there's a part of this that the parents have been helping us in ways that are really significant. And the next item on our agenda is the action item that we have to move to accept the donation from the All Sports Booster Club. Can I turn to you, too? Sure. Can we get uh, a motion and approve? Yes. First, First, we need to have a motion to accept the donation from the All Sports Booster Club in the amount of $41,855. Is there a motion for that? Thank you, Deanna. There's a motion on for that. Is there a second for that? Yes. Discussion? Sure. So similar to the fall season, the All Sports Booster Club is looking to make a donation to us, which we will then turn around and use to, uh, to pay the coaches who've been working on our behalf throughout the winter season. Uh, this is a shift, as we, may, as we talked about earlier, shift in the way that we were doing this so that the funds for these volunteer coaches, quote, unquote, um, runs through the Board of Education, which uh, 
helps us to understand total cost of program and also helps us for um, you know use our building use in our programs and all of the our volunteer coaches are certified coaches uh, there are six coaches involved in this forty one thousand dollars eight hundred and fifty five six of them are for uh, boy sports six of them are for girl sports um, so there's a balance there as we've I know has been an interest of the board and um, I just take a, a brief minute just to share the letter that came from Tracy Carl, who's the president of the All Sports Booster Club. Uh, the, All, the New Canaan All Sports Booster Club is making a donation of $41,855 to the New Canaan Board of Ed. The donation is directly related to the goals of our organization, which are to provide facility and resource enrichment for NCHS athletics, recognize and celebrate athletic-related achievements by all NCHS coaches and athletes, fund professional development for all coaches and support personnel. We believe lowering the cost, the coach to athlete ratio leads to more effective instruction and increases the opportunities for positive athletic experiences. The New Canaan All Sports Booster Club would like to make the following donation to the Board of Ed in support of the winter coaching positions. So um, I think their, again, their generosity, uh, as we saw in the, in the fall, the same way, their generosity enables us to truly uh, have great value in our program, helps to bring some, some coaches in, some instruction in that our students wouldn't otherwise have, and I think it is a key component to what helps our athletic uh, program to stay the top-notch, high-quality program that it is for all of our students. So. Any other discussion? It certainly is a remarkable thing for the parents to do and to have done every year. We now have a motion on the floor, and it's been seconded. All those in favor of the motion, please signify raising your hands, unanimous of everyone that's here. With a great thanks to the people who donated the funds, I think Indeed. that our students will really benefit from them and uh, it's a huge amount and uh, thank you. Thank you from the chair also. We now move to the action, uh, to the consent agenda and we have several items on the consent agenda. We would look at that and have a motion so moved. To accept the consent agenda. Second to consent. Thank you, Scott. All those in favor of accepting this agenda? That's a unanimous for everyone that's here. Thank you. And announcement about future meetings. Sure. We will have our statement of accounts at our March meeting, and we are also preparing an, a presentation about assessment in the district K-12. Uh, our smarter balanced assessments are approaching, our capped assessments are approaching, and we thought it would be a good time to have a presentation and conversation with the board regarding our in-house assessments, the external assessments, K-12, uh, and how they're related to our curricular efforts as we look through. Typically, as you, as you remember in years past, we had to have an assessment presentation in the fall, but now that we don't have the same data and we're on different timing, uh, but now that they're not using the CMT and the CAPT anymore and things, we thought that uh, in anticipation of the, the testing that's ahead, the assessments that are coming, we would have our discussion, share some information with the board and answer some questions. Um, the, also so you know, the Smarter Balanced Assessments, as we said, are coming up. A letter's going home tomorrow morning to parents of students in grades three through eight and 11 with some information about the assessments, uh, about the administration of the assessments and some other details that could be important. Uh, and also a link to the State Board of Education website, which has very detailed information about Smarter Balanced and data and students and, and the process that we'll be following. So. Um, that's going out tomorrow, and in two weeks or so, we'll have a presentation for the Board of Ed about these assessments and be ready to have a dialogue mm -hmm. there. Thank you very Thank much. You. Just yes, looking Penny. ahead, do you want to mention the April 1st meeting as well? I think that would be a great thing I had written down, or do um, I wrote that down as okay. an April. In fact, I think, Penny, maybe you should add the description of it since it's an important medi meeting right, that so you're concerned with. Uh, so it's an, a meeting April 1st, uh, 10 a.m. for the Board of Education. I very much appreciate your agreeing to have this special meeting. It's so that the SACS Building Committee can present the results of its Option 3 study um, that's ongoing right now. Uh, and we'll update you also on the, the work that the committee's been doing to find a, a project architect. Uh, we've been hard at work on that. And uh, I don't think it'll be that long a meeting. Um, we spent a long time trying to find a day and a time. Um, 
and this is uh, not really ideal, but it works, and we're hoping, um, uh, if you can't be there, please let us know, and we're hoping uh, parents uh, who are interested will also uh, 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 be available, uh, possibly, uh, April 1st, come. 10 o'clock, and 10 the public in is the invited, and welcome to attend. Okay. At this point. So thank you very much uh, for your consideration and scheduling that. We thank the chairman of the uh, auditorium committee for organizing this experience for us. So thank you. Um, any comments from the public? No comments from the public. Then we a motion to adjourn. Scott, thank you. Second, Allison. All those in favor? Again, unanimous. Thank you, everyone.